Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Jason Rasmussen. I'm with the Mount Escutney Regional Commission, uh, formerly known as uh, Southern Windsor County Regional Planning Commission. Um, I'm here with my colleagues from Upper Valley Lake Sunapee Regional Planning Commission and the Two Rivers Hello, Adekuchi Regional Commission. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves, but generally we're here to talk about our, our collective uh, Keys to the Valley project. Uh, and today specifically, we're gonna talk about uh, land use regulations, um, really focus on local regulations, not so much state regulations. Um, but uh, Olivia, uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Thanks, Jason. Yeah, I work for the Upper Valley Lake Sunnaby Regional Planning Commission in New Hampshire. Uh, so I am kind of representing that part of the team and uh, glad to be here and pass it to Tori. Yep, and my name is Tori Littlefield. I'm a regional planner with the Two Rivers Adequichi Regional Commission. Um, we primarily serve like Northern Windsor and Southern Orange counties. Um, and I guess just a couple housekeeping notes. Um, this is not a webinar, so if you could please mute yourselves, um, that would be appreciated. And um, I believe we'll be taking questions throughout the presentation and the chat is the best way to do that. Um, the button on that should be at the bottom of your screen. And if you do want to speak, um, you can do the raise your hand function under reactions um, on the bottom of your screen in Zoom. And we can call on you for that. Great. Uh, thanks. And uh, really to get things started, we wanted to know a little bit about basically who's, who's meeting with us. Uh, and so I think Tori, you're gonna do a quick little poll and I'm assuming I should stop sharing my screen so you can do your thing, right? Or? I believe it should be popping up on folks' screens. There's three quick questions. Okay, we have most folks answering, so I'm just gonna end it right now. Okay, so you should be able to see the results, Jason and Olivia. Yeah, uh, hopefully everybody else can see the results too. It, it helps me to kind of know who's out there. So it looks like, um, Planning commissioners and housing advocates are the, the top tier, a uh, number of uh, municipal staff, some select board members, some residents and others. So we got a really good mix here today. Um, so we're gonna get into some land use regulations. And so if I get into some jargon and things of this nature, uh, definitely please raise your hand or, or uh, ask me so I can explain myself a little bit better if, if this is not familiar uh, language for you. Um, let's see, so no, question number two, we were asking, you know, do you see land use regulations as a barrier to addressing your local housing challenges? And 63% said yes, and a number of you are unsure. So um, we can talk a little bit more about that uh, here in a, in a little bit. And the third question was based on your community's existing regulations, what best describes the required permitting process that someone you know, if somebody wants to convert an existing large single family detached housing house in, in the village into a three dwelling unit structure. Um, most of you, um, no zoning permits needed, that's 7%, not most of you, 7%. Uh, a simple zoning permit, uh, 19%, I, I like to see that one. Um, and nearly half say a, a full blown 
public hearing is needed um, and other. So I'd be curious what other is, but anyway, thank you so much. That helps us to get a, a sense of, of the group. So um, let's close that out. And um, we're gonna get started here. Um, See, I think so, Tori, if you're going to keep, if you could keep an eye on the chat, make sure I'm, uh, uh, I may not see it popping up. Let's see if yeah. there's any questions, let me know. So the purpose of this training is really to, um, to give you a little bit of an overview on uh, what this Keys to the Valley project was all about. Um, we're going to give you some highlights. Uh, we're going to share with you some tools and resources that are um, you know, specific to regulations that uh, could help your community to, to sort of address housing if you are, are so, if you so desire. We're gonna talk a little bit about some, uh, fo focusing mostly on the common easier type fixes in, in the regulations. Uh, you may wanna dive much deeper, but we're gonna try to focus a bit on the, the easier stuff. And also where to find more information. Um, there's a number of other, uh, housing related projects going on and ours is certainly not the only one um, and also sort of with that why reinvent the wheel we're also trying to connect you to some of, some of those other resources so for example on this screen you're seeing um, the zoning for great neighborhoods project in Vermont um, that was completed about a year ago that's also has some good tools for you so you know we're we're actually incorporating some of that in our presentation here today and I, you know, I encourage you to look at not only the Keys to the Valley uh, website, because uh, I think that has some good tools for you, but I think that also has some good tools. You might want to check that out if you haven't already. And also, um, I know less about it than perhaps Olivia might, but in New Hampshire, um, the same group, uh, the Center for New Urbanism, CNU, um, they're doing a, a similar project in New Hampshire on, on code reform for housing. So. Um, stay tuned for more information on that. And, um, you know, maybe more importantly, I think, at least for me, is that, you know, we want to hear what your questions are. And so, um, you know, we're going to go through a number of slides, give you, give you some information and some ideas. But we really want to, um, you know, know what you're thinking and have some, uh, some specific questions that we can answer and, or hopefully answer. If we can't answer, um, maybe you could give us your email. We can always follow up later on if, if uh, you stump us. Um, okay, so the Keys to the Valley, this is a, uh, a multi-year project that uh, me and my colleagues have been working on. Uh, the three regional planning commissions in this area that's basically shown on this map. Um, so we're in New Hampshire and Vermont. There's three uh, regional planning commissions. Um, Mount Scutney Regional Commission, sort of in that bottom uh, to the west of the Connecticut River. Two Rivers out of Quiche is to the north of us in Vermont. Um, and then Upper Valley Lake Sunapee is in New Hampshire on the, on the east side of the, of the Connecticut River. We cover a 67 town area uh, in that bi-state area. And um, you know, the, the needs of each town um, aren't necessarily the same, but you know, it, it makes a lot of sense in a lot of ways. Our you know, commuter sheds and, you know, the way the economy works and so forth. There's a lot of overlap. So in terms of housing, this is not the first time we've worked together and probably not the last time either. Um, so we, uh, as regional planning commissions, we have to periodically do housing needs analysis. And that's what this is. Um, but this time we're doing it a little differently. We intentionally um, are focusing a lot more on implementation as opposed to just the data. Um, so we have a bunch of data in this document and you can really dive deep into that if you want to. We'll touch on that a little bit briefly, but we're really more interested in um, what can we possibly do to solve this housing issue um, in our area. And um, as part of that, it's a big problem, we think, and um, it's gonna require some possibly big solutions. And so that's, we were, um, intentionally collaborative. We needed to reach out, we thought, to, to bankers and to builders and to supportive housing organizations, et cetera, if we were gonna be successful. So we had um, a lot of help uh, on our project steering committee and we had a technical advisor group 
and we did a bunch of outreach, which was really instrumental in this project. So hopefully, hopefully it's a better project as a result of that. Um, and lastly, just, you know, this map also does show um, the towns that have zoning and the towns that don't. And we, we certainly recognize that municipal regulations aren't uh, for everybody because certain towns don't have them. Um, but um, most towns do. And so um, regulations often come out as sort of the, um, one of the primary uh, contributors to the problem at, when we ask people. So we're gonna focus on that today. Um, so what is the problem? Uh, so, you know, if, if some of you might have joined us last week. Uh, we have, we're having weekly um, sessions on this topic. Uh, Alex last week talked about this in some depth. I'll try to hit the highlights, um, but certainly can answer questions if they come up. Generally speaking, projections are fraught with problems, but we did them anyway <laughs> to try to get a sense of, you know, what is the housing problem, not only today, but in, you know, say 10 years. We're projecting that um, by 2030, we, we're going to need something like 10,000 new homes in this area. Um, and that's a big number. <laughs> uh, in addition to that, um, about a third of our existing households are, are cost burdened. And what that means is there about a third of us are spending more than or 30 percent or more on um, household uh, either mortgage or rent. And um, that's not a perfect measure, but it's an indicator of when people are, are, are spending just too much of their income on housing. And um, of course we have this pandemic and uh, you're probably not surprised to hear me say a lot of folks are moving up to the area. Our real estate market is crazy and it's really just exacerbating this existing problem that's been around for, for many, many years. Um, put the problem in a little bit of context. Um, so 10,000 new homes, again, by 2030 is what we think we might need. Uh, there are only 4,000 new homes created in the last decade. So this is more than double uh, what we did the last time around. Um, and to uh, not to depress anyone, but <laughs> um, 10,000 new homes, uh, there's an estimate uh, by the, the Vermont Affordable Rental housing development cost factors report, if you really want the full details, um, they were estimating that an affordable housing unit costs about $228,000 per unit in 2016. So those are old numbers. It would be more expensive now. If we were to build 10,000 new homes, you know, tomorrow, we need $2.3 billion. So that, that's the scope of this project. Or the, this problem, excuse me. And, you know, the solutions aren't, you know, don't get discouraged. I think sometimes, you know, we're not talking about new construction necessarily. We're talking about, you know, converting large old farmhouses into, you know, what it is now, it's now maybe a one, a single family house and it's very underutilized. Maybe that could become a duplex or a triplex or something like that. So in a lot of cases, it, it might, might have those sorts of solutions or home share or et cetera. It's not all just building a new house. Um, and there, you know, there's a lot of contributing factors to this problem. Um, you know, I think, I don't know, many of us have, have seen the cost of materials has gone crazy. Um, it's hard to find a plumber, right? So labor, you know, finding, the, you know, contractors is difficult. Financing certain projects can be difficult. Um, and, and, you know, th all of those sorts of things, fear of change. Um, some folks might have extra space, but they're afraid to be a landlord. You know, there, there's all kinds of factors, but today we're going to focus a little bit more on the regulation part of things. Um, but the bottom line is the market, the housing market in this area, uh, simply hasn't been producing, um, many of the types of homes that we need. So Jason, so, I have a question. Okay. So uh, Devin Wilkie asks, are there any more granular projections about the type of homes needed within those 10,000? For example, proportion of single person versus family and multiple bedroom. 
Um, you know what? I'm not, I'm not totally sure. I'd have to ask Alex, to be honest with you. There is more detail, though, for sure. And I think one of the things that we're seeing is that, you know, the, the types of homes that we have available aren't necessarily the types of homes that folks want. There's, for example, there's a lot of talk of um, aging in place. You know, we're a, we're a aging uh, population in this area. And many communities uh, that I'm working with are talking about the need for smaller one level homes that are lower in price and allow people who are, you know, getting older to stay in their communities, but have something smaller, more manageable that they can manage. And, you know, some of those homes just aren't very available. Um, when they come on the market, they're snapped up really, really quickly. And um, so I think that, but the bottom line is that there's a, a real need for um, homes that are in the price range that, you know, are prevailing price ranges that, that folks have. And that's really what's lacking, I believe. Is there another question, Tori? Um, yeah, and then Ben Frost was wondering if we could provide a link to the affordable housing cost estimate. And it's the one on the housingdata.org, right? I'm not, is Ben asking for um, our projections, perhaps? Or is he asking for more information? There, there is, um, so maybe, uh, Tori, if you don't mind, maybe if you could put a link to the Keys to the Valley website uh, and maybe specifically on where they could find some of this data, that would be great. Sure. And um, there is also other information available out there as well, I think through both states. And I'm not sure if Ben wants to share something on the New Hampshire side, and we could also provide a link to the Vermont uh, housing data website as well. Okay, and so, you know, back to maybe this question a little bit is, you know, these are just some photos of, you know, when we talk about housing or affordable housing, you know, people have this image and, and they get turned off perhaps by what they think that means. Um, you know, these are the types of things I think we're talking about. Um, so the top left kind of working clockwise, the top left there, that's uh, the Wilson block in Springfield. Um, very recently, the Springfield Housing Authority and Partners redeveloped this building um, right in the heart of the downtown. It includes like 19 dwelling units and four um, commercial units. This is kind of a, I want to say typical, but larger rental unit type projects tend to be in the wheelhouse of our housing organizations, you know, Twin Pines or um, Wyndham and Windsor Housing Trust. And those are great. Um, they do great work. We need more of that, um, but it's not enough. And so we wanted to also just show a few more pictures of what this might also look like. Um, this next one is in Pomfret. It's a multifamily dwelling. Uh, keep going around clockwise. This next one used to be a two-story garage and a studio that was um, since converted into an accessory dwelling unit. Um, below that, is a, um, a tiny house in Claremont. You can rent it right now if you want on, on um, Airbnb, but that type of thing, um, again, smaller is cheaper. Um, so some of these are, are interesting ideas out there and they do exist. This next one is a um, from Vermont, which is a, a company out of uh, White River, or I guess Wilder. Um, they do some custom homes, they do some other things. So this is just one example of a single, um, single level, smaller home that might be affordable for folks. And this uh, final picture over here in the bottom left is a, a three unit uh, building. This happens to be in Brattleboro, uh, owned by the Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust. I see we have questions, Tori. Anything that we wanna hit right now? Uh, yeah, so Liz, Brian Cole was wondering if we had information about which towns have some sort of housing committee uh, she said, I know there are some master plans in New Hampshire that don't even address housing in their master plans, and Vermont does require a housing chapter, and Olivia put a link in for New Hampshire, and Noah Hodgetts also put in a link. Um, I think for us, Jason, I, I mean, Two Rivers, we don't have a list. We'd have to go town by town and look to see if they have a formal housing committee. I know yeah, what I, Doc does. <laughs> 
I don't have a list. Uh, Ludlow uh, in Vermont used to have one. They don't, I don't believe currently. I don't think many of our towns do. Um, and that might be a really good next step is that communities might want to create that housing committee to help help address this issue. Yeah, and several folks are putting in what they know. So thank you for that. Great. And so these photos are, ju again, just sort of like, this is the kind of thing we're talking about. There's other stuff. This doesn't encompass everything. You know, for example, there's somebody in Lyme looking to do co-housing. You know, there, you know, mobile homes in rural parts of the region in particular are perhaps affordable housing. Home share, and, you know, there's all kinds of other, other stuff out there that um, are part of the mix. But I just want to sort of set the stage with that. Um, Okay, so regulations, um, they certainly do contribute to the problem. Um, in the, the sort of the box to the right, you know, you might have been seeing headlines such as these, you know, there's an awful lot of talk of how zoning is a problem, how single family uh, residential zoning is really a problem, and it is. Um, the articles aren't, aren't wrong. <laughs> so it can, certainly um, bad zoning regulations can um, make it harder for lower cost homes to get to get built or to build to be built in the right parts of town, so to speak. Um, many zoning ordinances are, are pretty old. Um, there's a definite need to modernize them, in my opinion. Uh, and um, something maybe we can't really solve, but let's just acknowledge the fact that appeals and the sort of the NIMBY thing um, is is just part of it. And that that certainly does um, limit housing uh, and, and it prolongs sort of the, the permitting process. And um, anyway, those contribute to the problem. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, other, other regulations do also contribute. Uh, so we hear an awful lot where I am about how Act 250 should be, you know, streamlined or modified or something. Um, we're not really gonna talk about that today, um, but we, that. I acknowledge that's something, that's a conversation we are having and we should have. Um, state wastewater and water permitting, um, that plays into it. Uh, building codes, that plays into it. Um, on the Vermont side of things, we also have uh, like a state uh, energy code, you know, that, you know, makes it a little more expensive to build or renovate a, a home, but in the long run, makes it cheaper to operate. And you know, there's a number of other factors. I just want to throw that out there, but we're not going to focus on those for, for the purpose of today. Olivia, I think you're up. Okay. So I'm going to just sat, pull us out into the data just a little bit. I know it's um, it can still be helpful to to use it where it's appropriate. Um, so I'm gonna pass it back to Jason in a little bit to go over some of the key finding and action steps on the regulations. Um, but first we're gonna just run through some of the, mainly some of the results from our surveys that we did with questions related to housing conditions and desires. And this can, can really help this conversation to identify possible opportunities and barriers to using land use regulations as a strategy to address the housing crisis. I'm going to ask Jason, thank you. So our survey of municipal leaders, which was done probably almost a year ago now, included elected officials, board members, and volunteers and staff, and garnered about 139 responses from 50 different municipalities in the region. Um, more than half of those respondents were from our smaller communities with less than a 3,000 population, and just under half were from our larger communities with over 3,000 population. And we did ask them what would help a community promote new homes. And our respondents said that land use regulation was one strategy among many. Um, many of those others were largely infrastructure related, as you can see here, uh, municipal water, municipal sewer, broadband especially, and sidewalks were higher rated um, differently by our smaller or larger communities. And land use regulations kind of fell in the middle of the pack, a moderate opportunity was um, slightly more higher rated by our smaller communities. Uh, I think that might be also attributed to different infrastructure needs for our smaller communities versus larger communities. 
Um, and then also, thank you, Jason. Um, when asked whether certain improvements would have community support, land use regulations received relatively higher perceived support from municipal leaders. Although there was, as you can see, a significant disparity between our larger and smaller communities. With larger communities, almost 90% said their communities would support it and just under 20% for our smaller communities. And, and both of these graphs that we just went through show that land use regulations is generally seen as a moderate opportunity from our municipal leaders, according to their opinion, and that likely community outreach and even technical support might be important, um, helpful factors to make updates that are worthwhile and that have community support. Next. So I'm going to move now into some of the results from the public survey. Uh, in big picture, this survey had just over 1,200 respondents with representation from every community in the region. There was generally lower representation from renters, people experiencing homelessness and low-income households. So as part of the survey, we wanted to get a sense of what current residents may want for their own future home if they had the opportunity to relocate. So this chart compares where respondents currently live, and that's the bars in green, and where they pr would prefer to live if they moved, and those are the bars in blue. And so we see the most significant positive changes in home locations for village areas with a change of 10%. Um, while there was a loss in desirability in more rural areas, both on main roads and back roads, and some slight changes in other types of locations. And so when thinking about land use regulations, that these, these changes in desires are occurring, um, both because of changes in households, but also because of changes in lifestyle. Um, and that, that will inform where communities may want to incentivize home through land use regulations in the future. Next. So, so I'm gonna... Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Tim Jennings put in the chat, just an observation, 10,000 homes is such a huge number. It's hard to get one's head around how that could be done. However, if one divides 10,000 by 67 towns, that's around 150 homes per town. Many towns can't absorb even that number, but 150 new units seems a more manageable number for a town to consider. Definitely, it's a really good point. And I, I think that's part of, we want to see this as a regional collaboration. And there are multiple levels we can work on this at the regional scale, the sub-regional scale and the local scale. And each community is going to have a role in that. And depending on kind of location and infrastructure and suitability that might vary, but everyone has a role. Um, and so I think that's, that's a really good point to emphasize. And we're gonna get to a little bit of that actually in a moment, just looking at kind of the suitability at the larger scale. Um, but before we do, I uh, just really quickly wanna go through this graph, which is a little, I'm gonna walk you through it. Uh, so we generally, we ask residents their opinion on what types of new homes are needed. And this isn't all inclusive, but it gives us kind of a broad brush and some of the main ones. Um, I'm gonna, and so the bottom axis of this is gonna tell you the type of home it is. So mod, for moderate income household, rentals, if they, it's a home with supportive services, et cetera. Uh, and the vertical axis tells you what percentage um, of respondents responded with a support or disagreement or were uncertain what to think about. And so there are, and there are two bars for each um, type of home. The one on the left is respondents answering for what they see as a need within their town. And the one on the right tells you what they see as a need within their own neighborhood. So overall, the, the results were positive considering our housing crisis with very little disagreement in the red uh, on more homes needed, except for those of higher incomes. Um, and the most disagreement were for respondents saying no homes were needed and about 60% said disagreed with that statement. 
Uh, in particular, there was strong support for homes for moderate income. Jason, can you hit the button? Thank you. So there was strong support for households of moderate income, low income, and older adults in particular with between 60 to 90% agreement. Jason, once more. There was also strong support for low income homes. However, it did have the most significant drop in support, more than 20% when located in the respondent's own neighborhood. And there might be various reasons why a person might believe that a low income home not suitable for their neighborhood, but is suitable for the town. Um, but I do think that that shows that there is a need to show how low income homes look like and for designs to fit within existing neighborhoods because they can fit anywhere. Next. Uh, there were also many respondents unsure whether a certain home was needed. Uh, those homes in particular with accessible features and related supportive services um, had a near 30% respondents uncertain how to answer and otherwise good support and, and small disagreement. And so I, I, that shows to us that there this is a possible educational opportunity um, to show what these types of homes are, what does that mean and why they're important and, and where they might be uh, of benefit to a community and why. Lastly, there was also very strong support for rehabilitating our existing homes likely to their contributions to the character of the region, maintaining the um, embodied energy of structures. And on the flip side, uh, new construction and vacant lot development, click, thank you, found agreement from 55 and 51%, uh, and both with significant respondent uncertainty again. And so a little bit different, different from the earlier discussion on education, um, I think the, these re results highlight a preference for um, building rehab and also the importance for community involvement during the design and permitting process of new buildings and infill development. And so creating that buy-in early and involving the community throughout the process is really important. So we'll get more into that when we talk about actions um, of for land use changes. Next. So one last data item to mention is our places for home suitability analysis. So land use regulations balance a diverse set of interests and needs on how land can be used for social, economic, and environmental purposes. Uh, this is not news to any of you. And what places for homes did was it tried to look at many of these factors that you see here. Um, so they're kind of split. This is how the model worked, just to give you an overview. Um, split into three goals with sub objectives. And each of those objectives had multiple data sets that were available across the whole region um, that fed into the final results. Um, and so this gave us a better understanding of where residential homes are more suitable at the sky level perspective of the region. Next. So this was the result of that analysis. Uh, the orange um, rating um, were less suitable areas. A lot of that you'll see is around our parks and conserved lands that are, have, are particularly important for um, our natural resource protection. And then uh, the nine uh, the purple areas are, the dark purple ranges are more suitable areas. Next. At the same time, we did a community level analysis that identified three square mile, miles within every community of the most suitable locations. And so that, you know, circling back to that earlier point about this is a shared issue, there might be you know, a range of suitability, but every community has a location and, and thinking about that in terms of your land use locally and also protect potentially your neighbors um, is helpful when thinking about zoning land use. And so if I, we do encourage people to use this analysis, um, both in land use discussion and 
kind of community discussions on kind of these trade-offs that happen and definitely add your own data and local information. That's really going to make it the most useful to you. Next. Um, so last thing I'm going to go through before passing it back to Jason is just what's on our website. You've heard us talking about it a bit, um, but a few highlights to note for, for this particular discussion. Uh, the website's kind of split into a few different sections. There's the Our Housing Challenge. And so in there, you'll find um, kind of the details of some of these reports we got and data that we just went through. You can find the snapshot that looks more at the you know, census data, um, new homes data. The, then you can get into the results from the surveys and the prospectus report and the 2030 housing needs forecast. Uh, the projections information that Jason went through, and you can see the overview, and you also see tables that include town by town information, and that's organized by county. So that's where you can find all of that information, and of course, you can reach out to um, any of your any of us if you have any specific questions on that. Uh, then in the toolbox of solutions section, uh, Jason's going to get more into it, but there's a page that has uh, specific. Um, on the first stops for municipal leaders that uh, if you don't want to kind of go down the rabbit hole on your own um, and you want to kind of have a good starting point, you can go into the municipal leaders page and that gives you some places to start. There's also two summaries um, specific to regulatory issues, one on land use um, regulations and another on non-land use regulatory. And so that's in that section. And there's also a municipal policy review to kind of check in on how your regulations are doing and see possible opportunities for improvement and, and where things are going well and not going well. So um, Jason's going to get into that a bit more, but that's where that is in that toolbox section. And then there's also a, a library where you can play with the data yourself through the open data portal, and get definitions of terms, get um, links to resources uh, for um, outside of the Keys to the Valley project, some of which we've mentioned here, but there are many, many more listed there if you are looking for something specific. Um, I have one question, Olivia. Um, Christina Harold is wondering, does the municipal leaders page describe how to do a suitability analysis? And if not, where might we find that information? The no, the munis that page does not. The places for homes analysis is found under the our housing challenge section. Uh, that does give a um, if you're looking for it, a full description of how that analysis was done. If um, that's the level of detail you're looking for, if you're looking to do your own suitability analysis or to ad adjust this suitability analysis to meet your own communities specific needs, uh, I think that would be a question um, to ask directly to your to the Regional Planning Commission that's relevant to you and can give you more information. Awesome. And Bruce Garland is wondering if we surveyed developers. We did not survey developers specifically, although we did have multiple developers on our technical advisor committee. Okay, on to you, back to you, Jason. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, I'm not planning to walk you through the website, but you know, during, after we're done with the slides, we could do that if you, uh, if you so choose. But uh, I'm gonna just try to walk you through a few slides here that really highlight some of the, hopefully some of the easier kind of things that you might wanna think about. Um, I am, I'm integrating, um, there's a fair amount of overlap between what we have as a uh, zoning reform and what uh, the Center for New Urbanism uh, identified in Vermont. And, and I'm sort of uh, borrowing from them a little bit because it's basically the same information and why, cre why recreate the wheel. So if you see the little CNU uh, logo, uh, I am borrowing a little bit from their presentations um, that we're also using uh, for other things on the Vermont side of uh, but I think I th hopefully this will be helpful. Um, and let's see. So generally speaking, um, we're going to try to focus on dimensional requirements, uh, the 
you know, the types of housing available and what the review process is, parking standards, and a little bit on, on some of this um, other stuff. But you know, we're, we're probably not gonna talk too much about the um, street standards, but um, I guess I do wanna just note here that one of the, one of the things that we are calling for is basically prioritizing affordable housing or housing in general. Um, in places that are walkable and that have water and sewer and in, um, in ways because primarily they're along transit routes perhaps already, uh, they're smaller lots and or you can have greater density, which all, you know, smaller generally equates to being cheaper, all things being equal. So that's part of it. Um, we're not really gonna get into the street standards so much today, but just be aware that we're sort of you know, that's sort of part of that walkability aspect of things and a little bit of a focus on the village areas specifically. But again, we're gonna focus more on the other, the other topics here today. Um, Jason, I have a question slash comment from Liz Ryan Cole. Okay. It might be worth defining developer broadly. For example, choosing developers are not ordinarily seen as developers, but there is a developing pool of self developers in some ways, the failed Thetford housing project was a developer. Okay, so it's a good point. Yeah, so developer, I guess, in, in loose terms. So like in terms of our project, we were, we did want to hear from quote unquote developers. So whether, um, whether that's a carpenter, <laughs> or whether it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, the person who finances development projects or, you know, you name it. We wanted to understand from the folks that are out there doing it, um, you know, what their limitations were and what their problems were and, and so forth. Um, but it's an excellent point. You know, we, we recognize that it's a big problem. And so we're going to have to have a lot of homeowners who become uh, developers, so to speak, and um, create an accessory dwelling in the backyard or, you know, take those uh, two bedrooms that they never use upstairs and, and carve out a new maybe a duplex or something of that nature. So excellent point. Um, so how do you get started? <laughs> you know, it, it seems a little daunting uh, and all of that, I'm sure. So um, <clears throat> we have a, um, a, a detailed assessment or we have a, a, a little more simple rapid assessment on our website and the, the URL is, is listed here on this slide. This is what the first page of it might look like. Um, you know, you could, well, I guess for starters, you could talk to your regional planning commission. You know, we're, we're available. So if you're in my neck of the woods, talk to me. If you're um, in New Hampshire, talk to Olivia. If you're in Two Rivers, talk to Tori or Kevin. You know, we're, we're more than happy to answer questions or, or guide, get you started. Um, that aside, though, you can go to this website and pull down this uh, basically a a detailed checklist type of a thing. And you can do it, do an audit, you know, go through the town plan or we call it town plan in Vermont. You call it master plan in New Hampshire. Go through that planning document, see how housing is addressed or not. Uh, then go through your zoning and your subdivision regulations and, and see again how, you know, are there problems? Um, are your existing regulations creating barriers to, to creating new homes? And so hopefully this checklist is, is a helpful sort of start, starting point and it will also maybe give you some ideas of what you, what you might wanna be looking for. Um, and I guess also then, so, you know, the other aspect is, so you've done your audit, you've, you've used this checklist, now what? Um, you know, probably it's a good idea for a community to have a, you know, conduct that housing needs assessment if you have not done that already. There are tools available to describe what that means and how you might do that on your own. We're kind of hoping that you can borrow from this keys project and, and sort of in lieu of doing your own analysis, but um, either way, contact us. We can maybe help you walk, walk you through it. Um, and, you know, involve your community, update that the planning documents that you have for your community so that, um, you know, your town plan or your master plan really ought to spell out what is that housing situation? How does that relate to your, you know, your economic development strategies? How does that relate to 
you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, you know, policies that the community might have, et cetera. Um, and, and really spell out uh, the policy for the community, which will become the basis for your, for your regulations. So the, you know, the, the town plan or the master plan, that's really the starting point, I would say, for local, um, for, for locals to deal with this issue. And then, then your, your zoning follows, so to speak. All right, so Sorry, a couple we, we have, questions. Um, so Liz Ryan Cole is wondering if there's a repository where one could see problems people have encountered town by town. Not that I'm aware of um, specifically. I mean, hopefully we're trying to highlight some of that in the Keys project, but I don't believe there's a repository that I'm aware of of, of that. Okay, and then Chet Clem says, I think you'll find that us developers want to be part of the solution here, but figuring out how to close the gap between financial criteria and cost re realities and market needs slash procedural realities is the challenge. Thank you, Chet. Um, anything else, Tori? No, nope, that's it. Great. Okay, so <clears throat> here's here's uh, one set of ideas. So in terms of allowing for different types of housing uh, and maybe making the permitting process a little easier or perhaps at least a little more um, of, of a sure thing. You know, one of the things developers I don't think like is is when it's really unclear what the outcome is gonna be. So again, if you can make things a little clearer, avoid vagueness, uh, make the process a little um, more straightforward, uh, that's good. Uh, so a few specific ideas here. Um, actually, before I get into that, let me step back. So you're seeing an image here of the missing middle. This is a, 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 a term that's um, coined by the Opticos design. We're using it here to just sort of try to talk about the housing types that generally are not as available as um, we think should be. Uh, you know, we think that duplexes, um, you know, townhouses, cottage courts, some of these uh, smaller types of homes that might be either a rental or a condominium ownership scenario, you know, might, might be a little cheaper, might be a little more cost effective for folks, and they're just not being produced in the in large numbers in this region for whatever reason. So um, I want to explain that. Um, one thought is, so it's very common for zoning to have basically single family dwellings, two family dwellings, and multifamily dwellings. And that's kind of it. And for the most part, many of our towns anyway, the multifamily dwellings have to go through a conditional use review process that's similar to the um, special exception process in New Hampshire. Um, and even duplexes have to not uncommonly go through that full-blown hearing process, which I think is unnecessary in, in many cases. So I think um, one, one option is to maybe carve out uh, subsets of multi-unit uh, type housing Maybe, maybe it speaks specifically about three or four unit uh, apartment complexes differently than you do larger stuff. Um, and maybe, maybe you wanna think about making at least the, the three, the four, the five unit type uh, dwellings um, more of a permitted use, more of a by right thing, uh, especially in your village. Um, I think too often I see these apartments going through a local review process. And it's kind of like a no brainer, but they're going through oh, this big long list of, you know, standards and the hearing and this and that. And it just seems a little over the top. So if we know we need it, and if the community decides they want it, make it easier. Um, and you may wanna, you know, specifically allow other types of, of housing. Uh, you might wanna specifically call it out in the, in the zoning district tables, um, whether it's a live work unit, so that would be, a, you know, sort of where there's a, a studio or a, some sort of a business on the on the bottom floor, and you and one apartment above it. You know, somebody could own the whole thing, walk downstairs, go to work, walk upstairs, go home for dinner, <laughs> that type of thing, or any number of things. Co-housing, um, 
row houses, et cetera. A lot of these things are not specifically called out in, in zoning and maybe they should be. Um, again, up to, up to each, whatever works best in each of your communities. Tori, are there questions? Yeah, um, just a couple of them. Um, Joan is wondering if Chet's concerns um, about developers being part of solution is going to be examined at another session. I don't think that's a specific session that we're planning on, but it, you know, it, it's a really important point. You know, developers, we wanted them around the table because we agree with Chet. They're definitely part of the solution. And they're also, you know, on the other end of the regulatory end of things specifically. So they, they can tell me what, boy, that's zoning. That's a real problematic provision right there, you know? And so again, they're really important as part of this conversation. And they're also the ones that built the stuff. So again, we, it's really important that we work with them, not only as, not only as part of the, this planning work, but as we segue, you know, we're gonna be done with this plan, so to speak, in June. We're gonna then segue into implementation. It's, it's critically important that we collectively work together and talk to the developers as part of that. Great, and this is more of a comment, um, but Chet put in the chat that um, there was a bill introduced into the New Hampshire House last year, um, but it was killed in committee and it was a path to a fourplex. Yeah, you know, and some of these things might be a, a, re, a state regulatory thing, but a lot of it you could potentially do in your local zoning. So um, I'm noticing, you know, we're, we've got a half an hour plus left, so I might want to blow through a few more of these slides and then we'll, we'll, we'll keep answering questions, but I want to get through some of this too. Um, so again, just try to simplify that review process. Um, remove the conditional use or the special exception requirements you know, if it's really not needed. Um, another thing is, you know, it's not uncommon to see mixed use buildings either not allowed or maybe even in some zoning, they have to go through like a PUD, a planned unit development process, which again, I think is overly cumbersome. One simple fix is you might simply allow more than one principal use on a lot, at least within the village or the downtown districts, something to think about. Um, and then a lot of things, like I think of Windsor, if you're familiar, North Main Street, places like that where there's um, some really grand old homes, but they're just really underutilized. Um, places like that, where maybe they have the carriage house out back and you know, there's, there's abundant opportunity to convert these homes or the barns, the carriage houses into dwellings, a couple of rental units, something like that. So you might want to also consider um, adaptive reuse provisions in, in some of those cases. Um, might, might, be, might be one good way to handle that stuff. Um, we don't see an awful lot of accessory dwelling units being built. There may be other reasons like cost or something um, at play, but the regs also could be improved upon. Uh, I think you know, two common things are allowing them to be a little bigger. Um, it's common to make, you know, make them 30% of the primary house. And, you know, you could do 30% or 900 square feet or, you know, whatever the right number is for your community. Um, and the other thing that's common is zoning requires the owner occupy to occupy the primary house only. And you might want to loosen that up, allow them to live in either the ADU or the primary house. And that can change over time. Some of those things make it a little more... Um, user-friendly. Um, and then finally, you could consider exempting things. You know, if they're gonna, if the project has an affordability component, may, maybe it's at, at a smaller scale, maybe you wanna exempt certain, those sorts of things. Um, I was just gonna show you quickly, this is what it could, you know, potentially it might look like. This is one example of what uh, a use table potentially could look like or something like it. This particular one is for like a downtown district, such as maybe what you would do in a, you know, if it looked something like in this picture here, maybe something like this is something to think about, or at least it gives you some food for thought. So I, there's a lot of chat activity. Tori, is there anything that, any questions we want to tackle? Um, I'll just read this comment by Liz Ryan Cole. 
Um, a concern going forward, if we put all this new housing in village areas, something that FERD is doing, it will make the villages more dense than villages usually are slash people like. I think we should consider a model I've seen in England with small villages spread out and open space in between. Of course, we need to create more villages, but perhaps better than filling up our existing villages. Yeah, I, you know, I think that's a good point. I, and I think there's, a, you know, really that's probably up to each community. Again, back in your planning process, um, you could conceivably come up with a new village center or you could convert a part of town that, you know, has some level of density into being a little bit more like a village, you know, so that's, I think that's a great point. Definitely, I encourage that, that thinking. So, okay, moving on, dimensional standards, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of zoning, at least that I see, um, has really, really old <laughs> setbacks and minimum lot size standards and things like that, that I think were written in 1970s and um, might not have even ever been based in, the, it might have taken a model bylaw from somewhere else and just ran with it. So I think a lot of them are not particularly well suited for the, the zoning districts that they're in. So, you know, I certainly encourage folks to take a look at those and, and adjust them. You know, here's a couple pictures of one's historic, one's mo modern day Perkinsville. And this is typical of many village areas. Um, they have zoning, like one acre minimum lot size zoning right now, but more than half of the lots uh, are non-conforming. They're probably on average ha half an acre, three, three quarters of an acre, something like that. So they, you know, we encourage them to look at the zoning and really readjust those standards to be based on what, what's actually on the ground. Um, some other thoughts, um, you know, possibly remove that, that maximum density cap, uh, just control, control density with lot width, setbacks, building height. Try to simplify things, um, you know, if it's appropriate. Um, you might want to consider eliminating lot requirements for each unit, um, particularly where there's water and sewer. So like one thing that's common, we see that, you know, there's a minimum lot size in the downtown district, but then there's a, an additional, you know, for multifamily, you know, it's, you know, one unit per so many square feet. Maybe you just get rid of it. If you got water and sewer, if you have capacity, let them do more. It's going to, you know, result in more units and it's going to result in cheaper units, perhaps, as a result. Um, setbacks, like I was talking about here in Perkinsville, um, often or not, you know, if you got a 40 foot setback, front setback and they're, you know, on average 10 feet from the road, that, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You're creating non conformities and you don't need to. So again, just, just try to readjust those dimensional standards based on what's on the, on the ground today. Um, a lot of times taller structures might be a good idea also. Uh, I know there's some com communities have concern with fire, you know, response and this and that, but if appropriate, go taller. Um, and you might also want to regulate by the number of stories, not by a, a foot height type number. Um, and finally, on this slide, um, it, we are trying to, you know, prioritize some of this in, into village or surrounding the village type areas, but we recognize rural areas have a role too. Um, you know, mobile homes, accessory dwellings, converting an old house to two units, etc. cetera. Um, one of the problems that we commonly see is that in rural areas, they have like a zoning, the purpose statement said they want to conserve open tracts of forest, blah, blah, blah. And having a, like a 10 acre minimum lot size is sort of contrary to that. It, you end up carving it up into 10 acre chunks that don't, aren't helpful. And not, not only that, 10 acres can be more expensive than a two acre lot. So go with a bit density provision instead of a minimum lot size. And that allows for some flexibility. And it might also, you know, create some smaller, lower cost lots. It might also, um, you know, help contribute with maybe less forest fragmentation, et cetera, that sort of thing. 
Tori, I'm seeing some chat activity. Any questions? Yep, um, Richard Brown was wondering if um, we we're planning to talk about parcel size as a limitation. I think we covered that. Um, Joan Collison said on New Hampshire um, Public Radio's Laura Noy exchange this morning, a woman from Dover mentioned a plan for 44 units on seven acres with each unit being around 400 square feet. Micro homes being the future for affordability. Yeah, I mean, you know, a couple of, you know, in, in the Keys project, we're not talking about it today, but we called out a number of different sort of models or, <clears throat> you know, projects that we might want to emulate or um, do more of. Micro units are one of them. Uh, there, there's some, um, if you're familiar with Tail, Trail Break, the, the taco restaurant there in White River, there's some micro apartments above that, very successful. There's some that the Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust has done recently in Brattleboro. Those are also very, um, like, I don't think there's any vacancies. I think, yeah, in general, smaller is going to be cheaper. Um, and so more of that would be a, a good idea. Great. And then Olivia has been responding to some questions. Um, Kathleen Shepard is saying, Thinking of possible town tax incentives for adding units or dividing homes, do you know models of zoning plans that encourage more housing but prevent large scale turnover into Airbnb transitory rentals, which do not add to the housing stock? I'm not aware of that at the moment. It's a big conversation right now. Um, Ludlow, for example, has had a lot of conversations about Airbnb. Um, you know, a lot of the folks who who rent their homes or their you know units out are frankly making a lot more money with Airbnb than they are with long-term rentals. And there's a lot of conversation around that. I don't honestly know what the solution is, but um, yeah, very much a topic of the day. Okay, Rich Brown is wondering how do density provisions work as opposed to minimum lot sizes? Yeah, so I wish I had an image. It's sort of a, a mind bender for some folks. So, you know, a minimum lot size is, I think most people understand that. So let's say it's a, a 10 acre minimum lot size, rural type district. It's pretty obvious if you have 100 acres, you can have 10, 10 acre lots in theory. Um, if you change that, you know, no, no longer a minimum lot size, but it's a one unit per 10 acre density, maximum density standard. It's kind of the same thing, but instead of 10 acre lots, you can create 10 lots that could be potentially much smaller. Um, it's just 10 lots on that 100 acre tract, right? And so you could potentially have a two acre lot, a three acre lot, or, you know, and whatever remains that um, you know, can never be subdivided again. You probably need a picture to, to really explain it, but I, I, unfortunately, I don't have a, a picture to show you. Okay, Michael Snow asked um, what our thoughts are on transferring development rights to strip density from one area to another to concentrate density. I think, you know, transfer development rights is a, is a good tool. It, it's worked well in places that have had, you know, high levels of um, development. In my neck of the woods where I've been working for the last 15 years, we, we just have not had those pressures yet. Uh, it hasn't really been a thing that would be that effective, I don't think, in, our, in my neck of the woods, but it's definitely a good tool to think about. Okay, and then the last one, um, I don't know if you can answer this, but Chet put a comment, said, please ditch your foot height limits in favor of stories. And then Michael Snow was wondering why stories are better than foot height limits. Okay, so I guess, you know, what, what is it that you're measuring, right? You know, so some towns have this thing about, well, if it's taller, I need a ladder truck and we don't have a ladder truck for fire and blah, blah, blah. So there may be some reasons, maybe you don't do it, but I think it's easier to understand. Um, you know, so here's, a, here's an example. Um, and it has, it happens to have three and a half stories is the maximum building height. 
you know, that I think it's a little unclearer what you want. Uh, whereas, you know, what's 35 feet? I don't know. Uh, is that three stories? Is it more, you know, and how do I measure that? So I think to some extent, um, stories is just a little clearer. Okay, another question came in. Um, Liz Ryan Cole is, can you say more on lot sizes? It is a big tool for local planning boards to restrict new home development. Yes, one might think with 10 acre zoning with 100 acres, you'd get 10 lots. But in practice, towns sometimes divide, define lots so restrictedly that 100 acres with three acre zoning still only translate to, translates to four homes. Well, yeah, I mean, there's a lot built into that. I mean, you know, you got to assume you can get septic or sewer service or, I mean, there's all, all kinds of aspects to that. Um, if it's on-site septic and well water, you know, you got to have separations and, you know, you just have, you have to make sure everything works and yeah, you, you're right. You may not get the full 10. Um, so that's true. Um, you know, I think, you know, minimum lot size is just we've been doing it forever and we don't like to change and we're going to keep it. Thank you. <laughs> Tends to be the way, the way it is. Um, I don't know that the underlying actual acreage was ever necessarily well thought out. There, you know, like any tool, it might be appropriate in your community, but just make sure you, you choose that right threshold. So, you know, again, if you have a, a one acre minimum lot size where the vast majority of lots are a quarter acre. Well, it doesn't make any sense, you know? So again, I think just make sure that it, you know, it just aligns with the reality of what's on the ground today. Um, more, more questions, Tori, or should we keep moving? Um, I think it's probably good to keep moving. Okay. So again, um, what I'm showing you some of these little charts, these are just samples Please don't, you know, plug it and chug it, as they say. You know, each each community is different. You got to tailor it for your own needs and your own built environment and all that sort of a thing. So it's really just there to demonstrate a point. Um, and I, for one, am more than happy to talk to folks if they have more detailed questions after after the fact. So, um, okay. So parking, parking, parking. <laughs> one of the things we often hear about is is parking and there's never enough parking in the village and blah, blah, blah. And it's really difficult sometimes to convince folks to remove parking requirements, period. Um, but that's what I'm suggesting. I think in a, in a downtown district, I think it's, it's, it's more problematic than helpful to have on-site, on off-street parking standards. I think you just let them go. Or if you can't do that, politically or for other reasons, at least reduce them. Uh, most parking standards, in my opinion, are very suburban in nature and they don't really fit well um, in a downtown. A lot of lots just don't have room to, to provide the parking. Um, so definitely think about removing it or at least reducing those standards is the big, the big message here. Um, if you do keep it, um, definitely within village type settings at least, you know, please consider allowing some flexibility in terms of it being on street or maybe it's off site down the road, long-term lease kind of an arrangement. Um, there's just, there are too many downtown buildings that just have no land. They, they just don't have the space to provide the parking. And the big message that I would just offer is that, you know, you, you don't wanna create obstacles to redeveloping uh, some of these downtown buildings. And this, is a, this is the core of your community. It's precisely where you want some apartments. Um, if, you, if you do, uh, or if you must keep your parking uh, requirements, or if, if somebody wants to create it anyway, um, you know, you might wanna have some standards about where it is or how it looks. So putting it behind the building, maybe like is shown in this image here, or maybe if it's um, if it pre-existing, it's out front. Maybe you, you require them to put some landscaping buffer in front of it, or something like that. Um, you know, that sort of gets back to creating again in the village type settings. You know the walkable 
pedestrian oriented environment um, as opposed to feeling like you're in, you know, auto centric strip zone, you know, kind of a thing. Um, a lot of times zoning is not very specific. It just says you got to have two parking spaces for every dwelling unit. Um, that's certainly overkill for an accessory dwelling. Um, you should at least reduce the, the requirements for an accessory dwelling or, or other rentals perhaps. Um, or you might even remove, you know, not have any parking requirements for an accessory dwelling. Um, some many communities don't have this, but if, if you do have some kind of a traffic impact study requirement or guidelines, you know, specifically, you know, you might want to require them require them to talk about other modes, transit, walking, biking. Um, and another thought is also um, maybe for the larger towns, you know, if, if it's a larger project, they might have to make some improvements to the road network or something in lieu of traffic mitigation. Allow them to do other things. You know, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's they're, they're paying into a, a fee or maybe it's as simple as they, they provide some funding for the transit organization and they then don't have to make physical improvements perhaps. And um, a lot of this comes down to parking is expensive to provide. You know, a lot of this other stuff is, is also expensive to provide. And, you know, if we're focusing all this energy to create housing in a walkable community, maybe, maybe we ought to, um, reduce some of the costs on the developer if, if it's not in fact necessary. You know, you know don't, don't create extra parking because it's expensive to build it, it's expensive to maintain it, et cetera. Um, that's all I've got there. Okay, so this is just a, an example, some example language. Um, you see in this picture here in the bottom right, which Stephen might, <laughs> might recognize, just this is this is an example of a couple of buildings in a downtown that you know you see a little bit of a curb cut there behind it maybe there's a couple spaces but there's no way they can provide all the on-site parking required if they had standards so you know if you have stuff that looks like this this is really where i would say you should not have any parking requirements um or at least you know reduce it drastically um so here's an optional table here um, I'm not sure if this is quite the right numbers either, but you know, something more like this uh, might be more applicable than what a lot of towns have. Um, and finally, and then we can get into questions again. Um, if you do nothing else, and I'm borrowing this from CNU because I think it's really good advice. If you do nothing else, reduce your parking requirements, allow for larger accessory dwellings, and consider permitting a, a range of residential uses in your village by right. And what I mean by that is like a permitted use. It, it just needs a simple zoning permit. You know, let them have a, a fairly easy process of getting approvals within those downtown areas. With that, uh, Tori, are there other questions? I'll stop sharing so we can see each other perhaps. Great, none in the chat, but if folks want to do the raise your hand option, we can do questions that way. And if there's no questions, I, I see some excellent planners in, in the room, so to speak, if any of them wanna, <laughs> Uh, offer some other advice or observations. I'm I'm up for that as well. Mike, yes, you have a question. Um, yeah, and it's a it's sort of an how do we use this for implementation kind of question. I mean, I, I think um, uh, the more I look at the website, the more I find this. Wow, I I could use this and um, in my town in Thetford, and you know, in my work with with other towns. Um, but it's a, you know, the, um, I, I think you said one way to start is by connecting with our RPC. Um, uh, do you have other sort of first steps of, of, you know, things that we could, that the towns can do to, or planning boards or things to, to implement? I mean, you had to sort of, if nothing else, and here's some tools, things like that. Um, 
you know, are there a starting points, needs that, um, you know, who, who do we reach out to? We say, okay, we've got this need and, and we think these tools could work. Um, help us help us plan or present the first step. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I certainly encourage you to reach out to your, your regional planning commission. So if you're in my neck of the woods, talk to me or, or Allison. You know, if you're in Two Rivers, uh, talk to Tori or Kevin or whoever and Olivia or, or Alex or somebody in at the Upper Valley office could help you if you're in New Hampshire. Um, happy to help you get started. I think, um, you know, the Keys website does have that, um, the rapid assessment checklist. And, you know, my hope is that that's a helpful starting point is that folks can go there, kind of do their own assessment and um, if they get overwhelmed, they're like, oh my gosh, where do I, you know, go next? Call us or, you know, whatever. I think um, those, those two options might be the best starting places. So we got about 12 minutes or so. Any, any questions, folks, or observations? Um, there's one in the chat. Olivia did answer it, but it'll be good to say it out loud. Um, his question is, I assume that the 10,000 housing unit need projection corresponds with the projected population growth of the various towns. And Olivia said, Yes, it's based on the state protections for population broken out by age. And she did put a link to the methodology of where we came up with our homes projections. Yep. Yep. And, and I think another factor is that, you know, the, the average household size is shrinking to some extent. So as population maybe grows a little bit, you know, the number of households actually increases a little bit more because there's 2.1 or, or whatever it is of us in a, in a household and as we project into the future the, the numbers in the house in each house is shrinking a little bit over time any right, any other then, questions yeah one came in um, from Liz Warren Cole she was wondering if we will continue to hold meetings to find out what grows from these lunch sessions well, we do have a, a few more sessions uh, each Wednesday over the next couple of weeks. So you definitely feel free to check out those. And if you can't make them, Tori, we've got them on our uh, on the website and our we have a YouTube page, don't we? Yes. And I posted a link to our YouTube page in the chat. Great. And, um, you know, I would say, you know, again, we're, we are trying to wrap up the plan, so to speak, and... Um, shift gears into the implementation mode. And I think we, you know, don't get hung up on the 10,000 number because it's just a projection and it could be plus, it could be minus. Um, but I think we need to continue to work together if we're gonna chip away at it. And I, I really encourage you all to just stay in touch. Um, you know, I, I don't know what our implementation steps are necessarily gonna look like, but, um, I guess stay in touch with us. And, you know, if you're interested, um, you know, let us know and we'll try to keep you in, in the loop because we, we need to all work on this together if we're going to have a prayer of solving it or just partially solving it. Great. And I just put in the chat, um, we do have a very short survey out because we would like to hold um, some more sessions in June. Right now we have one. Um, every Wednesday through May. So if folks could fill that out quickly, it would be appreciated so we can hold some more. This is uh, Noah Hodgetts from the uh, New Hampshire Office of Strategic Initiatives. This is great. Thank you. Um, two questions. Do you guys have any plans of kind of tracking progress towards this uh, 10,000 unit goal by 2030 or anything along those lines? One, and two, have you, I honestly haven't had a chance to kind of go through your whole website in depth yet, but have you, you know, I think in, in our experience, you know, a lot of kind of techniques you've outlined are just good kind of planning practices in general. And a lot of the, one of the big impediments a lot of times is just a lack of political will 
to kind of make some of these these changes um, and build kind of within the town. Have you guys done or thought about doing any kind of case studies of communities that you know may have been resistant to you know even things like infill development, infill in village centers, which you know you've talked about being so crucial and kind of strategies that have helped kind of turn the tide to kind of get some of these uh, zoning changes passed. So I, any of my colleagues are welcome to respond, but I'll, I'll try. Um, we've talked about tracking progress. Um, it's data is not always easy to come by and you know, we're somewhat leery of coming up with a metrics that you know, are actually doable and we have funding to actually handle. But yes, we've talked about that and I, I think we are gonna try to commit to doing some basic uh, tracking. And I don't know exactly what that looks like yet, but um, yeah, it's important that we figure out a way to track progress over time so we have a sense if we're doing well or not well or you know whatever it is. Or maybe more importantly, where are we doing well? Where are we not doing well? You know, what, what are they doing right over there? So that maybe somebody else could try that technique elsewhere. Um, Olivia, Corey can add onto that if they want. And the only thing I'll add to that is um, there is the, although metrics are, are kind of, can be a challenge to work with to some extent, and even the 10,000 number is pretty loose as Jason has discussed. Um, the, the, over the last couple of years, um, particularly Vital Communities has been doing their the new homes data collection. So we have been trying to get a sense of how many new homes coming on the market and what types of homes those are and, and what kind of affordability they have. Um, even that is, is challenged by, you know, different ways that different, you know, communities track, especially if we want to track things like conversions and whether or not they have accessible features. So I think that, you know, working with, well, that's one area where um, having a partnership regionally and locally um, to have, to make it easier to track some of these things so we can um, know how we're doing um, would be, will be helpful to, to make that, those, that information more useful. And, and I'd also note that um, the Vermont legislature is talking about a bill um, that would have a, basically a statewide um, rental registry and something like that would make it a lot easier to, you know, because that's kind of hard to come by, the number of rental units in a building and that sort of thing. So if that does actually go through, that'll be potentially really helpful to help us to, to count those. Um, and I think your last question was lack of political will. <laughs> you know, I don't know what to tell you, except that, um, you know, I think we, you know, the more a community talks about it, um, you know, if, if a group of 20 people show up at a select board meeting, they're probably going to listen to what they have to say. Mm -hmm. um, sure. So if there's, a, if there's a, a group of folks that say, listen, this is really a problem, you know, the school can't hire a new teacher because they can't find a house. And, you know, this business over here can't recruit mid-level management because they just, there's just not a good house that they can buy. Like, this is a critical problem not just because the regional planning says so, but because the businesses say so, you know, and that sort of thing. I think, you know, maybe that's an approach, but, you know, I don't know. I, but I also think with the pandemic situation, I think everyone's talking about it. <laughs> I think it's, it's less of a, it, it's an easier sell, I think, at this point. Hey, Jason, can you hear me? Yes, um, I, I think one of the things that that I think would be important are, are the consequences of failure, um, because, you know, we're like in, in my little town, we're looking at, you know, the possibility of eventually closing the school, losing our post offices. Um, the fire department may not be able to function. You know, you, you do need a certain amount of growth. And I think that it's. I think in terms of the political will, I think that may be one of the things that we need to, you need to hit a little harder in terms of the consequences of no growth. And there are consequences, obviously. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Good, good point. Uh, Jacqueline, you have your hand up? 
Yes, I do. A quick question. Governor Scott has talked about um, using some of the funds that will become available through the um, uh, federal program to bring us back to normal. And he's really focused in on housing and what that's one of the things, affordable housing. Are we doing anything or thinking about anything at a regional level that might put us in a better position to get access to these funds? I, you know, I'm, I'm more than happy. I might not be fully informed on the topic. I, I believe there's sort of a, a preliminary list of where some of those funds are going, but I, I could be wrong. Um, maybe Mike knows more about that, but um, I don't know. But I think we're, we're trying our darndest to just get this out there and get everyone aware of the problem. Um, I think I heard something about the Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust being on the list for some of those funds. And I'm not sure where else... Um, is being considered for that. Mike, do you know any more about that? Uh, I mean, no is a strong word, but I, I think I, I am aware of things that people are working on, but nobody knows yet how it's going to play out. Um, as you know, in both, I know, and I just done a call a little bit earlier about Vermont, that the, that, you know, the governor's proposed funding to be available, the House has proposed funding, Senate's proposed funding there. They are working those into where they would, um, you know, they, they're working to a compromise uh, of what the numbers will be and, and how it'll get distributed. Um, but, but there is money certainly coming for, um, uh, at the town level, there's money coming in this Vermont side and, you know, at the, um, and, mm -hmm. and coming to the regional development corporations, um, coming to the housing authority, state level and, you know, the, the different uh, nonprofit developers. Um, and, and nonprofit developers have put in who, who take a regional look, you know, just like the regional planning commissions do. Um, they, they're, they, a regional look at where, where there are opportunities and, and so that things aren't necessarily, um, I don't think earmarked to use that term, but, but there, there is a, a bunch of money coming and there are a bunch of projects proposed and there'll be some alignment that shakes out and, uh, and, that's, I guess, what I'm aware of. That's certainly most current uh, conversation I was in is on the Vermont side, but um, similar things are happening with um, at the county level in in on New Hampshire side, and um, and with the governor's uh, governor's new task force on housing, um, that and and some of the the budget discussions that are going on. Um, so the so in in both states in both places, yes, there is a regional effort to um, to say how can we how can we utilize these funds that are available? Um, and, and I think, um, well, opinion here on this whole keys thing, that, you know, this is our framework to think together. Um, mm. that that's why it's been created by three regional planning commissions working together. And, and we're gonna have to think together about alternatives because the system we have right now works really well at doing what it does, but it doesn't meet our needs. So we need to we need to have this we need to adjust this system that we all live within, and and the the funds that are coming are give us a chance to invest in some alternatives to try some new things together, um, that to to be able to to sort of work outside the box that our system is currently in, um, and and have this system be able to meet our needs over time. So, yeah. Long story. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Yeah, it just seems like forewarned is forearmed, and if we could, you know, I understand a lot's in flux, but if we had a short list of priorities that we were really intent on getting approved for our region, you know, that might help us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's a good point. You know, I don't think we've we're kind of waiting to see what the federal guidance is on some of these ARPA funds. And um, Tori put a uh, a link in the chat, so. If you're interested on the Vermont side, at least um, the LCT is putting out a, a little workshop on this uh, coming up. So there's a link to that in the chat if you're interested. So we're we've we're past one one thirty. Um, any last minute questions? One more before we go. Well, hearing nothing, you know, I hope you found this helpful. Um, the website is. Is there for you, uh, to, you know, 